You're listening to the Virtual CISO Podcast, a frank discussion providing the best information security advice and insights for security, IT, and business leaders. Welcome to the show. Hey there, and welcome to yet another episode of the Virtual CISO Podcast. Uh, with you as always, John Furrier, your host. And with me today, Eric Jesse. Hey, Eric. Hi, how are you doing, John? I am doing well, sir. It's a Friday afternoon. Looking forward to uh, looking forward to a good weekend. Uh, I'm sure you are as well. And you were kind enough to record this at four to five on a Friday night. So we'll we'll try to get you out of here on time. Okay. No, happy to do it. Um, so always like to start super easy. Uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and what is it that you do every day. Great. No, thank you. Uh, so I'm a partner in, in Lowenstein Sandler's insurance recovery group, and I've, I've been at the firm for, um, you know, 12, almost 13 years now. And uh, we like to say that we're, um, that we're on the side of good and righteousness because, um, you know, we fight the good fight by representing only corporate policyholders in uh, coverage disputes uh, against insurance companies. And so, you know, we, we handle all types of coverage disputes under all types of policies, whether it be, uh, directors and officers, professional liability, reps and warranties, and pertinent to our discussion today, um, cyber insurance. Um, and John, I do like to tell the story, um, that when I was a 3L in law school, I signed up for an insurance law class and I had realized I had enough credits to uh to graduate so i said insurance law who i'll never need that and uh so i dropped the class but here i am today as an insurance lawyer um and i was i was drawn into this area i think you know just you know um you know in part because of the variety of the work you get to touch so many different industries practice areas you see different issues so this is the uh, variety that is the uh, spice of uh work life um at least yeah, it is nice working in any vertical that has lots of dynamicness and change. Otherwise, it's easy to get bored. Uh, yeah. Information security is an awesome field for that reason. It's like, yep. you know, I was explaining my my uh, daughter's going coming into information security. She graduates uh, this year. Oh, and, congratulations. Uh, yeah, and, and, you know, and I was trying to explain to her, like, even when you've been doing it as long as me, like every, you know, every day, 20% or 15% of what you do is brand new. Right. Uh, yeah. So, so I'm sure it's the same with you, which, which makes, which keeps it fun. Um, yeah. Before we get down to business, we usually ask, what is your drink of choice? Um, all right. So this might be my, my favorite question of the day. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it, it varies over time. I kind of like to, to switch things up, but uh, I, I do enjoy uh, beer. So on the, and on the beer side, uh, I'll say I've recently gone down, gone back to my uh, dad's German roots and have been enjoying some German beers. Um, and on the spirit side, I'm, I'm a fan of um, bourbon. So sometimes neat, uh, sometimes an old fashioned and in the spirit of the uh, Kentucky Derby being upon us, uh, certainly a mint julep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't know that I've ever actually had a, I'm a bourbon guy, you know, as, yeah. you, as you probably can see from the shelf. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, 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 and I'm also a beer guy. We, we drink a lot of, you know, the, the fun thing about beer is that it, it's become a family thing. We're like, we'll go to, we'll go to a, a, a different microbrewery or we'll go to a bar that has like, you know, 20 or 30 different types of really good, fun microbrews on tap and, and you're, you know, and you're sampling them and it, it's just, it's, it's a, it, it can really be something which is an awesome awesome family event. You know what I mean? Um, so, so I'm getting lucky enough that my, uh, my kids over the, of the age that they can imbibe. So, uh, it, it's kind of brought a whole, a whole dimension, new dimension to the family. Um, I, have a, I have a few years before we're there with my kids, but, uh, I'm sure we'll get there. <laughs> uh, it, it, you're going to get there faster than you think. I can tell you that. All right. So, um, so you mentioned, uh, a cyber liability insurance, which is why, yeah. you know, why, why I asked you to come on the podcast today. So, one of the more significant challenges, uh, you know, from the pandemic is how work from home changed information yeah. security and security architectures, right? By creating more opportunities uh, for more malicious people to do more malicious things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the numbers were staggering. Something like ransomware attacks hit like 37% of all companies last year. You see numbers like $20 billion. Now, of course, yeah. many of these attacks ended up in 
claims against cyber liability insurance. Yep. So now we're paying the price because you know I'm chatting with clients and I'm hearing what my uh, we might not renew our cyber it doubled or my cyber tripled. Mm-hmm. Um, what are you seeing? Yeah, so the the answer is is a lot. Uh, there's a few and there's a few. Um, things here um, that we're seeing in, 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 in different in different ways. So one thing is I always describe cyber insurance as the Wild West um, because the risks and their severity, they're always changing um, and the insurers have to try and keep up with that. So they need to constantly be changing their policy forms, endorsements, their underwriting process. Um, so cyber risks are, are obviously on the rise. The pandemic exacerbated those risks. Work from home certainly did as employees were using their personal and not work devices. And, and now we have the Russian invasion of Ukraine and insurers have certainly have uh, concerns about increased attacks as a result. And, you know, the president a few weeks ago confirmed those risks as he told uh, American businesses to be on alert and to strengthen their cybersecurity. And so the insurers have been hard, hit, hit hard on uh, on the claim side year after year. And you're right, that all translates into not only just the increased uh, premiums, but increased policy retentions, which is the loss that the insurer, that the policyholder needs to um, incur before the insurance company. Uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a retention sort of the equivalent of a deductible? Yes. Yeah. Think of it okay. like that. They're, they're very similar. Um, there's also just, you know, the possibility of lower limits or sublimits being put onto these policies and just more restrictive uh, terms and conditions. And so that's one of the things we're seeing when we're reviewing just cyber quotes. Um, I think another thing that's worth mentioning here is just how... Um, you know, these the increased risks and claims activity is impacting the underwriting side of the the insurer's house where, you know, that's the process where the insurers are evaluating the risk and actually negotiating and placing the policy. So, so there, um, a few years ago, it was, it was commonplace where an insurer, where a company could fill out a relatively short uh, application, give it to their broker and, and, and get cyber insurance. Uh, and now the process is starting to become more intensive. So insurers are really wanting to probe and understand, all right, what, what, what cybersecurity systems does a company have in place? They want to know what's being done to train employees to, to address or you know, thwart uh, cyber attacks or prevent cyber attacks. And we're, we're also seeing something that uh, I think existed many, many years ago and seemed to have died down and now it's coming back. And, and that is underwriters wanting to interview, you know, chief information security officers and CTOs to really um, probe those security systems. And that's um, something that companies cannot, um, you know, that, that's a part of the process that companies um, you know, can't, can't take lightly. They really need to practice and prepare for those those interviews and have ready um, explanations for either real or, or perceived um, gaps. And, um, you know, there's just other, the, the other point I wanted to make on this is, um, and because this is the other thing we're seeing, is just how insurance companies are, are dealing with, with, with claims when they come up. And, and this is where my policyholder advocacy and insurer cynicism will shine through. But... Um, insurers have been, and I think they'll continue to be just more aggressive and difficult on, on claims as they try and look for savings. So to, to be, to be, you know, just even more cynical, we often say in our policy holder world, um, that when a company buys a policy and pays premiums, you know, they're really paying for the ability to try and negotiate coverage for, for a claim. And I, I'm happy to share just a, a war story to put that into to perspective. And and, and that is, um, you know, we had a client several months ago who faced a ransom demand uh, and the insurer only agreed to cover a small percentage of that demand. And so the client was going to have to make up um, this, this massive difference. And the insurer's position was, well, the threat actor only stole data. They didn't encrypt data at the company. And so the harm was, you know, quote, the harm was done. 
And that's not how the policy works. The harm wasn't over because the threat actor was threatening to release this data. It was, and so we had to tell the carrier, tell the carrier again, that how sensitive this data was, because it wasn't just employee data. So employees are gonna be harmed if this is released. It was financial information. The client operated in a very competitive environment. So there was trade secrets. And, and by the way, the insurer's panel counsel recommended the payment here. So we had to get involved and tell the insurance company, listen, you're acting in bad faith. And under New Jersey law, uh, bad faith allows a policyholder to recover their consequential losses. So if we're losing a customer because our competitive data is out there, you're on the hook insurance company. So we did have the law and the facts and the policy on our side and marshaled them to eventually get the carrier to pay in full. But, you know, we shouldn't have had to do that in the first place. So I was going to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. You know, I was going to ask yeah. you how the insurance companies got themselves into this mess. But I think, in yeah. a sense, you started to answer that, right? Uh, I mean, yeah. you know, you, you talked about the fact that their underwriting processes early on were pretty immature, yeah. and and I think from the folks that I know in the industry, I think a lot of that was, you know, there was a giant pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. They did not have the yeah. actuarial data. They didn't have the experience necessary to do yeah. that underwriting. And they said, yeah, we'll, we'll write as many policies as we can, and we'll catch it up on the backside. Is that, is that a fair yeah. assessment? Yeah, I, I think that's right. So where I would, you yeah, know, the way I'd answer that question is saying, you know, certainly the insurers were not underwriting as intensely as they, they wish they should have. So I think that's the contributor here. But, you know, beyond that, I, I can't really say that the insurers are to, to to blame because the reality here is that this is just an area. Cybersecurity is an area that's filled with major risks, changing risks, increasing risks. And, you know, the threat actors are persistent here in trying to find new ways to penetrate company systems. So, um, and the other thing here is, you know, the, the, the carriers um, were, were adapting to, to the risks. So I'll give the example of, of ransomware where, you know, several years ago, I think you know we would see ransom demands in the thousands or tens of thousands of dollars, and so insurance companies had sublimits of fifty or a hundred thousand um, dollars in their policies. But the carriers, you know, as those demands went up, the the sublimits went up. So now we often see one million dollars sublimits for ransom or cyber extortion um, demands, and and that's good for policyholders. But now with the onslaught, you know, the carriers are being um, with the onslaught of uh, ransomware demands, you know, the carriers are going to have to pay at those higher sublimits. Yeah, I mean, I feel bad mm -hmm. for everyone involved in the process in a way, the insurance companies, because, you know, the problem we were running into is, you know, we'd see firms getting uh, cyber insurance policies for two, three, four thousand dollars relatively small amounts, yep. small companies. And, you know, when you think about it, the process of doing due diligence on a company is going to cost them that or more. So really what they ended up having is a situation where you couldn't afford to do due diligence and sell the policy at that price point, right? Because the due diligence yep. was costing more than the actual than the actual policy in and of itself. Now, as these policies double and triple in price, and as we find ways of relying on, let's say, third-party data, you know, third-party attestations, yep. things of that nature, it may be, hey, we're willing to write a, a certification, excuse me, we're willing to write a uh, policy, but you have to be ISO certified. Or if you're ISO certified, we'll give you a discount. I mean, I guess that's really where the direction this is going to end up heading. Yeah, I, I agree with that, and 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 I think you you you, know, you you pointed out you know that's what I was seeing too a few years ago those those relatively low premiums and mm -hmm. there's only so much you know time you can invest in underwriting that process so I think uh, the carriers will look for um, for lack of a better term shortcuts through those certifications or you're going to have just you know uh, much more extensive app insurance applications. Um, you know, applications I saw a few years ago, you know, were, were often just a few pages, you know, now they could be much more intensive as, um, as, as the, um, you know, the, 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 uh, cybersecurity systems and protocols have to be, um, you know, detailed in that application. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so we, we have the, uh, misfortune of, uh, <laughs> having to, uh, review very often our clients' cyber policies and, you know, uh, to me, not only are they complex, I would argue it's legalese and it's actually a legal document. So what my question for you would be, what percentage of yeah. companies um, have their policies reviewed 
by a cyber liability insurance, cybersecurity knowledgeable attorney, and what percentage should have been yeah. reviewed? <laughs> so, so I, I think the, the answer here is not enough and and all of them. I, I <laughs> well, you said you. It, in, in the opposite order, though. All of them yeah. should and not enough do, right? <laughs> yes, not enough do, yes. So, um, you know, I can't give you... So you're, you're right. This is... A, this is a legal document. I mean, if there is a coverage dispute, you're going to have a court, you're going to have a judge interpreting what that policy language means. So, so you're absolutely um, right. And I, so I can't tell you the precise number of, of companies that, that you know, or the percentage that have their, their policies reviewed by counsel, but, but the answer um, is, is that they all should. And, and I think there's just a, there's a few reasons why uh, it makes sense to do that. So, you know, as you mentioned, these are complex policies. And, and frankly, these are some of the most, you know, I, I, as I mentioned at the top of our the podcast here, you know, we review a whole host of different policies. These are one of the most complex ones that are that are out there. Um, there's a lot of exclusions, the devils in the details. You do have um, defined terms in these policies from A to double Z, and I'm not exaggerating. Uh, when I say that. And so, uh, you know, we like to say you need the secret decoder ring to understand what's in these policies, because in those definitions is, you know, in that minutia is where the scope of coverage and those exclusions um, actually live. Um, and then, you know, because these policies are complex, this isn't something you should just purchase and renew and just put on the shelf and forget about it because you're, you're doing yourself a disservice. Um, you know, given the risks that all industries face on the cybersecurity front, these policies are, can be very valuable, can be very important, and it's worth the time and investment to get them right. And maybe some companies or a lot of companies don't, don't um, realize this, but oftentimes what you can do is you can, you can negotiate, try and negotiate for improved terms and conditions and counsel can help you put together that wish list um, and you won't get everything and you know what you may get is going to depend on the premium because a carrier is going to approach a ten thousand dollar policy different than a hundred thousand dollar policy but you'll get something and it's helpful because once you get that improvement into the policy it can carry forward as 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 you re renew um, and then the other thing is you just need to understand what is required by these policies because, you know, you need to know about, you know, sublimits so there are surprises and, you know, other um, just requirements um, in the event of a, of a breach or a claim. So I think my answer to the, the uh, do, do enough of them, I would say the vast majority of them don't have anybody look at it, which, yeah. which, which is kind of crazy not the more I think about it. Um, and then, you know, and I know that they – not only do they not have legal review, I don't think they have business review. Um, we we were working yeah. with a New Jersey county, uh, and we had reason to look at the cyber liability insurance mm -hmm. policy as part of a project. And um, the main reason they had the cyber liability insurance project was uh, policy was to protect a particular database that had a lot of sensitive information in it, personal identifiable mm -hmm. information and health information of 60,000 uh, residents of the county. And um, mm -hmm. on review of the policy... They, they had a, uh, I don't know what the right word is, an exemption, exclusion, rider, whatever the right term is. Yeah. But a any database above 50,000 names was not protected. Right. <laughs> so it's right. like, yeah, you don't need to be an attorney. You just need to actually be someone yes. who, someone's got to sit and read the policies. And I know they're painful, right? It's like it's like watching grass yep. grow a paint dry uh, for some of this stuff. Yes. But yeah, there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong if you're not looking at these policies. Yeah, you're right. And yeah, so I mean, so... I have on my web bio that, you know, my job is to read insurance policies uh, cover to cover. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's what you have to do to really understand it. But I take your point there. And you'll, you'll be surprised how many times we see policies issued that exclude, you know, a major component of the business um, or, or the, the thing you're, you're really hoping and expecting to be insured, which is why, you know, from even from a business perspective, you know, you need, at least need to do that page flip. And, and, you know, also just make sure your broker, you know, understands, um, you know, what you're doing and what the risks you need to um, have covered are too. Yeah. So I, I am not a, uh, a cyber liability insurance guru, nor am mm -hmm. I a guru at all with regards to insurance as a whole. 
So in chatting with yeah. uh, some of the folks that sometimes will engage with uh, when we're looking at cyber liability with a customer, um, what I've understood is that cyber liability is only a part of a broader, I'll call it an umbrella of insurance coverage. Uh, you know, and, yeah. and there's things like crime and DNO and other policies that are important. Yeah. And, and that one of the key things that somebody needs to be cognizant of is you have to understand how these pieces fit together because you could end up with gaps in your coverage or, or overinsured and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Like I know we had a client, if I recall correctly, that um, they thought their cyber liability insurance policy would pay a claim because someone left a laptop in a car with with uh, with uh, twenty thousand names on it, and, but it, that should have been covered by the crime policy, and it was either excluded in the crime policy or something of that nature. So, can you talk yeah. a little bit about you know beyond like so? I call you up and I say, hey, Eric, got this cyber liability insurance policy. You want to review it? You know, or should you be looking, should they be asking you to look at one policy or should they be looking at you look at the umbrella of policies to make sure that these things fit together in the way that they think they do? Yeah, I, I think what's important for that from that perspective is, you know, I think the starting point is really to make sure that a company just has the right insurance program in place just at a starting point. So do they, all right, so they have a cyber policy, good. Do they have a DO policy? Good. Do they have a crime policy? Good. Do they have a professional liability policy? Good. You know, those are, are those are things we want to you know just make sure companies have as a as a starting point. And then you know at that point you want to drill down a little bit. Um, so you know from a cyber and, and the reason you need to make sure that you have that that panoply of of, of coverage is a cyber incident can implicate multiple different types of, of coverage. So you could have a cyber incident. So you're going to look to your, your cyber policy to respond to, you know, for example, the third party claims brought by, you know, the employees or the consumers whose data has been lost or, or, or stolen. Right. But if there's a public company, for example, that, um, you know, that, that, that was attacked, you know, there could be shareholder lawsuits. Um, brought against the board of directors because they're going to allege that the board didn't exercise proper oversight, didn't make sure that there was the right cybersecurity um, systems in place, and as a result, you know the company was harmed. The value of the company, the, uh, the, the 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 stock price went down, and so um, there you're going to need to look to your your DNO insurance policy. So that's part of the reason you just as a starting point need to make sure that those those the, the, that program or those programs exist. And then, you know, in the cyber context, you need to make sure that that policy has the right coverages because for companies that provide professional or technology services, you can get coverage for that risk in a cyber policy. Companies that have media liability exposures, you can get coverage for that in a cyber policy. Now, crime, I think, can be a little tricky because uh, companies should have a crime policy for sure, but when a it, just in my experience, when a crime insurer has been faced with a cyber crime claim, like a fraudulent instruction or social engineering claim where you have this threat actor pretending to be the CEO of the company and emailing and, you know, pretending to email an employee to, to wire funds, um, um, you know, cyber, you know, that, that, that can be covered under a crime policy. But crime, in my experience, crime insurers just resist covering those. And so, what I like want client, what I want clients to do is try and get cyber crime coverage added to their cyber policy because um, I think this, just the, the the claims handlers on the cyber insurance side are much more you know just accepting of of those claims. They have the right mindset to um, to try and provide coverage. So that's how we you know approach the. Um, you know, the, all the different policies that can, can be in play when we're reviewing, you know, or looking at, at, at cover or the, um, the, the cybersecurity risk. A quick question. Um, can, yeah. could, if you, if, if, if something was deemed negligent and you weren't appropriately covered under a DNO, could, could something end up piercing the corporate veil? Like if you're the owner of an organization, I mean, mm -hmm. could, could that happen? You know, let's say that you're an owner organization, you fail to put the proper, you know, uh, information security controls in place. Uh, there's a large giant breach. Could, could, could you end up, 
could the director, the owner of said company, be be you know, and end up in a situation where that breaches the quote unquote corporate veil, and they'd be have some personal liability? Yeah, I mean, I, that, I think that that scenario is is always out there. I know that you know piercing the corporate veil and these alter ego claims are often very you know going to be very. Um, fact sensitive. So that's just going to depend on, you know, how, how is, how is that company being, being run? But, you know, that, that can be one of the beauty of, you know, a DNO policy, for example, where um, that policy is designed to cover directors and officers. So if that veil, if that corporate veil is pierced uh, to go after the directors okay. directly or directors or officers directly, you can look to your side and you can look to that DNO policy. The other thing I'll, that's worth mentioning is a cyber policy too, just does not just cover the company. It also will cover directors and officers and employees, um, you know, that are negligent. Obviously, if there's the rogue actor um, or the rogue employee, there's not going to be coverage there, but for that negligent director or officer, um, th there can be coverage under a cyber okay. policy if they're being held you know, responsible for that, that, that specific cybersecurity risk. Yeah. Gotcha. Cool. Thank you. Um, so, you know, one of the other things that you need to be aware of, right, and, and a good attorney can help mm -hmm. you figure this out, I'm sure, is that cyber liability insurance policies often specify certain obligations, right? You know, that, that you, mm -hmm. you know, treat data yeah. in accordance with reasonable and appropriate security standards or uh, very yeah. often, you know, your incident response requirements are, are usually specified and if violated could can actually obviate coverage so what should what yeah. do you know what should orgs put in place you know pre or post purchase you know to make sure that they understand yeah. those those obligations yeah so th this is this is this goes back to my earlier point about you can't just put this policy on the shelf and you need to really go through and understand what's being required because I'll use the example of the, the you know, the fraudulent instruction claim or the social engineering claim where, you know, the policy may require that, you know, there be appropriate verifications put in place um, you know, to make sure that the, the communication or the request to wire funds is, is, is authentic. So you need to make sure that, you know, you're, you're complying with that because if you don't um, and there's still a resulting loss, um, you know, that, 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 you know, um, you, you, you could avoid the coverage that you're expecting to have there. Um, another, you know, important component is um, understanding what the notice requirements are. I mean, that's kind of just the threshold obligation to getting access to the policy. And it's important to provide prompt notice of a claim or an incident because, you know, these are, these are going to be claims made policies. And an insurance company, you know, they, they can be very harsh. An insurance company can deny coverage for um, late notice. And so that's why it's so important to provide, number one, to provide prompt notice. Or, you know, the other thing that companies should do is, if, is to try and, at the negotiation stage of the policy, try and relax those notice requirements so that the insurance, so that there's language in the policy that says, all right, you can't, if, if we're late in giving notice, the insurance company can't deny coverage because, um, you know, because of that lateness and then unless the insurer could show they were um, prejudiced. Um, just another important component is consent. These policies are filled with insurer consent requirements. Um, so, so, for example, there needs to be consent for, um, you know, for, for any costs that are incurred, for any settlement. And, and this also ties into the computer forensic expert that, um, you know, that, that, that is going to be, um, whose costs are going to be covered under the policy. Um, you know, policy, so these policies will um, often require the policy holder in the event of an incident to use the insurer's uh, preferred or panel consultant to work through the data breach and negotiate with the threat actors or pay the ransom demand. Um, so, you know, there's a few things companies can do there. You know, one is if they have a preferred consultant that they want to work with or a, a cybersecurity consultant, they should have that endorsed, that, that company endorsed onto the policy and have them pre-approved so that in the chaos of a, of, a, of a breach, you don't have to fight with the insurance company about that. You can just pick up the phone and call them. Um, or another option is just to do your own due diligence on who the insurance company wants to work with you. You know, ask them who who's on their panel so you can get comfortable. Um, with yeah, them. I think that that is 
super important and was something that we always push for. Because like you said, I mean, you do not want to be in a situation where, you know, the faster we can contain an incident, the less impact it may have. And, you know, so minutes are critical and not have it being in a situation yes. to say like, well, w- what kind of a company do we need? And, and let's call it, and it's, of course, this is going to happen on a you know Thursday at, you know, 5.05. And now you're picking up the phone and trying to call data forensics companies and no one's answering the phone. And it's not till the next day that you right. get this thing going, right? So you want to be in a situation. In fact, if you've got a high enough risk, you want someone who's actually probably on a retainer, right? So that way, that, that way you know, they've yeah. got a de- defined response time. Uh, that they they've yep. contracted with you uh, based on you know based on that so yeah I couldn't agree with you more yeah um, one other okay uh, yeah but I was gonna say and, that, and that's the rest because you don't want you know you don't want because a lot of comp we've seen it with clients before where they call up the, their cybersecurity company at, right after a breach you know before they're even telling the insurance company and so you're you're you know and then the insurance company says well they're not on our panel so that creates the risk that all right you know, tens of thousands of dollars of, of work has been done that the insurance company might try and deny coverage for. So better to get that pre-approval. Um, well, even, even worse, right? If they go too yeah. far down a path, and let's say that you don't know a lot. I mean, one of the advantages of using an approved vendor from the insurance company mm-hmm. is the fact that, you know, they are at least reasonably qualified to do the work. And if you're not someone who knows yeah. how to research a digital forensics company, you might be better off using them. Uh, because if you hire someone Absolutely. who doesn't know what the hell they're doing and they make a mistake then and they destroy evidence, the insurance company could, in theory, say, hey, we're not going to pay for anything at this point, right? Not only are we not paying for yeah. what those guys charge you, we're not paying the claim because you didn't follow a, a good process. It, it, yeah, exactly. They can make... Uh, um you know, say that, yes, that, that claim or this issue has now been exacerbated because, mm-hmm. you know, the wrong people were involved. So, and, and I, I will say on, you know, in terms of the, the panel service providers, the computer forensic firms, um, the, you know, the insurance companies, I think they do have, you know, very well qualified, um, you know, service providers there. So I think that just as a general matter, policyholders can take comfort in knowing that the insurers have lined up the the right um, companies. And, and that said, but still, you know, do that due diligence ahead of time and put in your contingency or your data re- or your disaster response plan. Right? You need to have the name of that company, you know, ready to go. Um, you know, rather than trying to flip through the policy or, you know, having to go through, uh, you know, go to the website that's in the policy where the panel is listed to try and find the right people, get all that done up front. Right. Um, so what most people may not realize is that if you have a breach and you are covered by cyber liability insurance, you end up following their formula. You know, I've only been involved in it once. Um, it was eye opening. Um, but you know, you'll get what they often refer to as a breach counselor, and that breach counselor is usually an attorney uh, mm-hmm. that's got some information security knowledge. And in a sense, they're defining the game plan um, for for you guys to move forward. Um, now, it would seem that their procedure might logically be slanted um, to shift some of the burden of cost yeah. <laughs> to your team, and, and and or limit their coverage cost. So. Yeah. If you are, so let's say that somebody doesn't have an attorney that, is, that, that reviewed their cyber liability insurance policy, but they do have a breach, should they get an attorney to represent their best interest, you know, w- w- as they're going through the breach response? Yeah. So, um, you know, just as we were talking about with the computer fr- um, forensic expert and the panel there, you know, the insurance companies will have their panel attorneys. And look, frankly, one of the benefits of these pol- major benefits of these policies is that they do provide coverage for this mm-hmm. breach response coach, which is an attorney, and they will provide defense costs if there's a third party claim and you need to be represented by an attorney. But, but the, you know, where I expressed a lot of confidence in, in the insurer's you know, panel of computer security forensics, I'm a little more jaded on, 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 you know, the panel council. Um, and, and that's, and, and this is frankly just a tent, you know, something we see under so many different types of policies. So it's not just cyber because, um, you know, the insurers will have, you know, appoint their, their counsel 
um, if, if that's what's permitted under the policy. And sometimes you can negotiate around that. But that council, that panel council, their ethical and fiduciary obligations are to the policyholder, and they must work in the interests of the policyholder. And look, I've worked with plenty of council, uh, panel council where they've done that. Um, but there is certainly a tension because panel council also, you know, knows where their next case is coming from, and it's and it's probably not the policyholders; it's going to be the insurer. And so, um, you know, the, the answer to your question might depend just on the magnitude of the of the claim. But I think it can be a good practice to have your own counsel, your own privacy or data security counsel with that you'll have to pay for, by the way. Um, but just look over the shoulder of the insurer's panel counsel to make sure that the claim is handled properly. Uh, and the other thing I've seen is panel counsel, I think rightfully so, because they're appointed, appointed by the insurer, they are not going to opine on any coverage issues or engage in any coverage battle on your behalf. And so that's where, you know, coverage counsel might, might need to be called in. Yeah. And, you know, and the other thing too, is that, you know, I always find that when you've got a, a cybersecurity person talking to a cybersecurity person, that's different than if you have an inf- a, a business person talking to a cybersecurity person. So yeah. if, if that counsel, the outside counsel, that's the panel counsel, knows yep. that you've got an attorney on your side and they're involved in one or two of the conversations, I think it sets a level of expectation. Okay, hey, somebody's here. You know, I, I just yep. think it raises the bar a little bit that, they, that they're yeah. going to hold themselves to. And I think that there's, you know, if there is a, I can lean this way, I can lean this way on this issue, I think they're going to lean the way that they're not going to get beat up by your counsel on, right? I, I, yeah, no, I, I think that makes perfect sense. And I, I agree with that. So, you know, just having your, your own counsel or your, you know, the, the counsel you want to be looking over the shoulder, just kind of appear on the scenes, you know, once or twice, and then, you know, can take a, a much more, you know, um, you know, backseat. Um, but yeah, I think that that's right. Just it, it does uh, set the expectation at the very outset. So I agree. Um, I think we beat this up pretty good. Anything we missed? <laughs> No, I think uh, I think I think we we covered you know everything. Like I, you know, I'll, I'll just emphasize that you know this is a policy that you know will be very very important to many companies as um, you know as the cyber risks um, uh, you know just continue to grow, unfortunately. And so this is not a put it put this is not a policy you put on the shelf. Uh, so I'll ask you our super special question. Give me All a right. fictional character. And look, you know what? The fact that you kind of leaned into it tells me that you're prepared. Give me a fictional character, a real world person you think would make an amazing or horrible CISO and why? So, um, so this will be my second favorite question after my favorite drink. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I'm thinking of a, um, a character that Jimmy Fallon used to play on Saturday Night Live. The IT guy? One, probably like in the earth. Yeah, he played that arrogant, <laughs> know-it-all computer guy who would just insult you in the process. Um, so, so I think he, he, you know, he'd be good maybe on the technical side, um, but would be horrible on the people side. And we talked about those, um, you know, those calls that the under cyber underwriters want to have with your IT people. I'm sure he would be horrible on uh, on that call. <laughs> So, so, so you get so, so yeah. you gave me so I asked you to give me one or the other. You gave me both with one. So that that's efficiency. Oh really? I did. <laughs> that, well, you said he he'd be he'd be great on the he'd be very oh, good yes, on the technical yes. side. And he'd be terrible on the people side. So yeah, you, 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 you gave me you gave me both. Do you, do you bring that kind of efficiency Don't to your legal funny. practice? Because because I got I got to tell you, you know, people like efficient lawyers. Uh, Absolutely, we try to for sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so uh, if folks want to get in touch with you uh, with regards to your services, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, so I mean, um, you know, if you Google Eric Jesse and Lowenstein Sandler, um, you know, I'll, I'll pop right up. Um, or you go to Lowenstein's, you know, insurance uh, page, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be on there. But email, you know, send me an email, pick up the phone. Um, and I'm, I'm always happy to, to, to chat and answer any questions. Sounds good, man. Well, listen, here's the good news. We, we got off in, I'm giving you 17 minutes back in your day on a Friday afternoon. Hey, so look at that. I'll, I'll take you it. Are, you are what? So I guess I am equally efficient. You're welcome. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you.
All right, oh, man. Uh, listen, this has been this is you know I listen. You made a you yeah. made a topic which is you know for some people not fun fun. So I appreciate that. Thanks, man. All right, good. I tried. Well, this was a pleasure. So thanks yeah, for so, having me on, John. I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate you coming on, man.